Hello and welcome once again to Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I sincerely hope you're staying safe and doing well in these difficult times. Today I want to talk to you about a topic that again is one of these big topics that we'll talk a tiny bit about in this class, but you can get more later, which is the topic of knowledge representation. And in particular, we're going to talk about logical representation of knowledge and about how we can work with those representations to actually solve AI problems. So a lot of this will be a review of logic from courses you may have had previously but hopefully it sets us up to talk a little bit about how we use logic in an AI setting and why it's still so important there. See, when we first started doing AI way back when, it was really believed that humans reason symbolically. That was a really popular view of how humans thought. We now know that's probably not very true. And it was believed that if we could just teach a computer some logic, teach it to reason symbolically, then it could reason like a person. Now this didn't pan out, but along the way we did discover some amazing cool things and it's still a technique that can be really, really useful in solving some kinds of AI problems. So off we go. So, you know, so far our problem representations for AI problems have been pretty ad hoc. In previous lectures, we've talked about representing things as a state space we've, and as states. We've talked about representing things using you know, data, normal computer science data structures. One of the first problems that we've talked a lot about in AI is how do we accurately describe the problem so that it can be solved? How do we choose a representation of our instance in the computer that's a, that has good properties? And then we have to select some algorithm, which turns out to be a lot of times the easy part. Once you've got that far, once you really understand the problem and really understand how you're gonna represent the data describing your instance, eh, then the algorithm kind of answers itself a lot of the time. And then we run the code and we get our answers. So I wanna focus on those early steps for a bit. So when I'm choosing an instance representation of the computer, what properties do I want it to have? There's a lot of things I could try for. And, you know, sort of ad hoc doesn't cut it very well. A lot of times you'd really like to get some better than ad hoc representations. First of all, even as the instance get large, I'd like the representations to be compact. If I'm not really careful about an efficient representation or a compact representation of data inside the machine, then I can really run out of memory fast. We've seen that with a lot of with uh, stop lists and that sort of thing that tend to grow exponentially with the size of the instance. We got to watch for those things. I need a representation that's useful. I need one that is compatible with good solution algorithms. So, you know, you can imagine all kinds of fancy representations that are real compact, but, but to manipulate them, to figure out what you're gonna do to solve the problem, you kind of have to take them back apart into less compact things. I want the representation to be sound. I should never be in a situation where the representation tells me something about the problem that isn't true. So for example, in a sliding tile pop problem, I don't want two tiles sitting in the same square ever because that's not a thing that can happen in the real problem. I want completeness. I don't want to lose any information I've decided is important. So in a sliding tile problem, any representation of the state, I should always be able to find all the tiles and find out where they are. I'd like a general representation, one that can represent sort of all the instances of interesting problems, or at least all of them that we might care about, which is usually most of them of a, up to a certain size. And so for sliding tile puzzles, I would hate to pick a representation that only worked for some kinds of sliding tile puzzles. And I want one that's transparent. And that kind of goes back to this utility property. I want it to be really easy to think about what the representation means. So far we, for our sliding tile puzzles, generally just use the state being an array of tile positions, you know, array with 
each position, each tile being positioned in the array. That's a fine representation, partly because it's really easy to understand what that means. It's easy to print it out and look at it. It's easy to uh, see how to slide a tile in that representation. So in that sense, it might be better than some fancier representations. And sort of, if you want to get more generality, if we're not just thinking about sliding tile puzzles or even just about puzzles, but representations that might cover a large variety of things we want to represent in as instances of problems in the real world, then we might try to choose some general representation strategy. Here's some of the ones people use. They put information about things into a database. That's an ancient and popular today strategy for storing information is just to keep a collection of facts in a database and reason about them using that. A neural net you can think of as a representation of instances of problems, right? The collection of neuron weights is kind of a neat representation in some ways. There are very efficient algorithms for working with it that it uh, seems to be have high utility in terms of producing the desired result. There's some properties it doesn't have, right? For example, neural nets are not transparent at all. If I look at the weights in a neural net, it's almost impossible. It's a current research project and a lot of what we've done is proof theorem saying it's almost impossible to look at the weights and figure out what that neural net knows, what, what that representation is. I've done a lot of functional programming, but in AI too, we tend to use functional representation sometimes. We have a collection of functions that describe how things go. The one I want to concentrate on today is, like I say, this ancient one that's still very much in use, which is logical formula. We represent our stuff as logical formula. And if you go back to the uh, homework assignment we were doing in class, you'll see that I formalized the problem as a first order logic statement, as statements in first order logic. That turns out to be a really nice way sometimes to work with things, and that's what I wanna concentrate on today. So I wanna do a bunch of review of what we're talking about here. Let's start with propositional logic, which we've already talked about a lot in the last few lectures, which is this idea that I have these things, we'll call them atoms, but we also sometimes call them variables that can be either true or false. It's real common to have subscripted names in the logic space. You know, I might have A sub I sub J as an atom name. That Those are still just atom names, but it can be really handy to do that sometimes. And then I have these connectives, I have the and, connective, the or connective, the not connective, and parentheses that are used to go together. If I'm careful about it, I can construct what's called a well-formed formula in propositional logic. If none of this sounds familiar, really go find a discrete math textbook and review it because it's super important to be comfortable with this stuff. So I go back and find my uh, well-formed formula that represents a situation and I can do some things with it. I can transform it into some standard form, and that's usually a polynomial time, polynomial space activity. So for example, there's a poly time algorithm to transform any propositional formula into CNF, into conjunctive normal form. And a lot of times that is a first step in solving the problem is to tackle that CNF representation. Checking for a given assignment. Is a formula true or false? So, you know, for some given assignment. So we know that's poly time. We know that's linear time in the size of the formula. We can just go through and evaluate the formula. And I think all you, you could easily build an evaluator like that. Satisfiability. Is there an assignment that makes the formula true? We've talked some about that already and about how you might decide whether there's an assignment that makes the formula true. That's an NP-complete problem. And then there's the tautology problem, which is does every assignment make the formula true? It turns out you can solve that in as an NP-complete problem as well with some extra variables. This is sort of the theorem proving problem is you're trying to decide whether something's a tautology. And for propositional formula, all this stuff is straightforward. And that's great, 
But propositional logic is kind of limiting because all I get is propositions. And, you know, having variables that can only be true or false is pretty limiting in a lot of situations. I can't do arithmetic with that, or at least not infinite arithmetic. I'd like to have more. And the first level of more that's really common to work with in AI systems is first order logic. So in first order logic, we have the same kind of thing as with propositional logic, except instead of just having atoms, we have predicates, right? A prop logic thing might be A and not B and C. Uh, here, these things can take arguments, uh, A of X and not B of X and C of Y. And these X's and Y's then sort of this thing might be true for some x's, false for other x's. This might be true for some x's and y's and not for others. This might be true for some y's and not others. And so we have these things where things are in a form where we can represent sort of an infinity of truths about A by just subscripting it with a variable. and. That Those variables X and Y right now are what are called free variables. A lot of times we don't like free variables in these formulas, and we will insist there be some kind of quantifier and that these things be in quantified form. So the things I can write are for all X and uh, there exists a Y. This, these are the quantifiers. And then of course there's fancy notation for all of this, and I'm not gonna try to do it on a terminal, but it, it exists. And uh, so I could make statements like this. Then so for every X, there exists some Y that A of X is true and B of X, Y is false and C of Y is true. And that's, that's a first order formula. And we, like first order formulas because they're expressive. We don't like them because satisfiability goes from NP complete to undecidable, tautology is undecidable. And so they're a lot harder to reason about. And that means that we may, it may be very convenient to work with them from the expressiveness point of view. You know, it's got some of the properties we wanted of a representation. Others, good algorithms to work with things, eh, not so much. So a compromise, and a compromise we'll be working with for a bit here, is this notion of a quantified propositional logic. Um, and so what we do is we write things as first order formula, we're fine with that, except that all these variables are bounded in what they can range over. So uh, for all x in 0 dot dot 10, there exists a y in, uh, you know, a, b, or c, such that a of x, see now, this isn't a statement about an infinite number of things. This is a statement about 30 things, right? There's sort of, well, sorry, 33 things. There's sort of 11 states X can be in, three states Y can be in, and so there's really sort of 33 separate statements made here. And the trick with quantum, with this, with this, is from this I can go to a propositional statement, even though it's comfortable looking like a first order statement, I can go from here to a propositional statement by just allowing everything to blow up. So let's get rid of this inner exists a Y in ABC. We're gonna replace this with by what's called grounding out. We're gonna take this thing and um, say, well, A, Y could be A, or, oops, sorry. Let's try that again. Y could be A, or Y could be, um, oh, apparently I can't do this. A of X and not B of X comma, B, because Y could be B, and C of B, or, and I can do the same thing with um, C, right? So I guess I might as well finish it out at this point, A of X, 
and not b of x c and c of c so we replaced our existential with a bunch of ors and now we've gotten rid of y we have one less variable to think about and if we change this x to something less ridiculous than 10 just for the sake of writing on the screen i can now take this whole formula and say and and replace all the x's so now i have a of zero and not b of zero or a of zero b of zero uh and then i need zero for x there oops now i've done it should use the text editor oh well And it has to be true when X is one. And so we go and replace all these X's with ones. And now we've got rid of all the variables. There's no variables left in this statement. It's just a statement with things. And then the last step is now that these predicates don't have variables as part of their arguments, I can just replace them with atoms. So I can make a new atom uh, A under bar zero and a new atom B under bar zero under bar A and so forth. I can make an atom C under bar A and continue like that. And I'll end up with a statement with a whole bunch of atoms in it, right? In this case, I guess six times three is 18 different atoms potentially, maybe not quite that many. And, but the point is that that'll be a propositional statement. When I'm done with that process, what I'll have is a statement in propositional logic by just taking the for alls and turning them into ands, the exists turning them into ors, replacing the predicates with subscripted atoms. And so that means that this quantified propositional formula we started with was just a shorthand notation for a large proposition, propositional formula. And so that's great because it makes it more convenient to write and it reduces mistakes. And then the process of actually turning that QPROP formula into a prop formula is completely mechanical. You can automate it with a machine. So those representations float around a lot in AI. We use them for a lot of things. And in particular, I want to talk to you at some point about using them to solve some of the kinds of problems we've already been looking at. See, what's happened is over the last 40 years, the SAT solvers have gotten really good. And once I have a propositional formula, even if it's a very large formula with a lot of variables and a lot of clauses, it turns out that a good modern SAT solver is likely to be able to solve it quite quickly. And so this strategy of representing a problem in QPROP form, turning it into a prop problem and feeding it to a SAT solver, turns out to be a really winning strategy for solving a lot of the kinds of problems we've been working on. So that's what I have to tell you today. As always, thank you much for listening. As always, please do continue to stay safe and well. And I look forward to talking to you again soon.